الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد واليه ترجعون واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جزيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا منه شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين Last time we started to delve into the subject you see on the screen الناس في القرآن people in the Quran or mankind in the Quran and if you would remember from the outset of the Quran Allah made two things the primary subject of his book the book itself and the subject of guidance and choice from the outset ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه before Allah talks about anything he wants you to know what is most important what is most important and the most valuable gift that Allah has given humanity is this book. Indeed, we can never thank Allah enough for anything, but for this one in particular, unless you lead a fully righteous life, then you have thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but still, you need to be sincere for Him to accept it, and you need to thank Him in the right way for your thanks to be accepted. So from the outset, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه. Allah wants to establish trust and confidence in the source. Very important issue. Humanity is gone astray for centuries because they went after sources other than the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Ummah that should never go behind everybody, ever. Not that there is nothing good with anybody's hand, but we have more than enough in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's why in the Hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ مَا إِنْ تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا فَلَنْ تَضِلُّوا بَعْدِي أَبَدًا أَبَدًا I have left with you two sources. If you hold on to them, you will never ever go astray. You will never ever go in trouble. What else? Allah is saying this book indeed has guidance. This book indeed has no doubt. لا ريب فيه. Hudan lil muttaqeen. And the Prophet is saying, if you follow this book, if you follow the Sunnah, you could never go out of line in your relationship with Allah. Kitab Allahi wa Sunnati Addu alayha bin nawajid. Bite on it. The book and the Sunnah, hold on with your strongest teeth. The canine teeth, which means hold to them as strong as you can. Let not anyone take you away from it or take it away from you. Let not anyone confuse you about it or throw doubts regarding the book or the sunnah in your heart. Why? Because these are the two sources that will keep you on the straight path. So from the beginning, Allah made the book the subject of the book. 
And in this, there is a huge significant value that is in comparison to the Qur'an, every other book, no matter what it is, doesn't compare. This is the book, the only book that has no doubt is the Qur'an. The only book that has no discrepancy is the Qur'an. The only book that has no mistake to correct is the Qur'an. The only book that has nothing to be reviewed is the Qur'an. What else does Allah need to tell us to value his book? He said there is no doubt and it is full of guidance. So who benefits from the guidance? It's not Allah, it's us. So we have to be careful that when we deal with the book, we're dealing with the book of Allah. You see how much we value al kaaba right? It's so significant and valuable in everybody's life. Right? This is where we direct our face when we pray. This is where we travel to make Hajj. Right? This is the place where Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was born in Mecca. So it is very precious for every Muslim. The whole town became precious. Not only the Kaaba itself. But the Quran is what told us about the Kaaba. The Quran is told us about the, the house of Allah. ذلك البيت and ذلك الكتاب Allah told us in his book could we have ever appreciated any previous prophets had the Quran not told us about it no we couldn't have known them we don't know the prophets that the Quran did not tell us about we don't know منهم من قصصنا عليك من قبل ومنهم من لم نقصص عليك some of these prophets we have told you about, O Muhammad وسلم, and some we have not. Do we know any prophet other than what is mentioned in the Quran? We don't. Do we know a third possible fate other than paradise and hellfire? We don't. Where do we know about them? From the Quran. So the Quran doesn't only have a value that is intrinsic in it, qima but it also has a value for me because I am the target of the Quran I am the target so after talking about the book after talking about the guidance Allah immediately gets into the classification of people who are people what are they so people are divided in the Quran, هو الذي خلقكم فمنكم كافر ومنكم مؤمن. Allah is the one who created you. Some of you are in denial of Allah, in denial of His blessings, in denial of His guidance, and some believed in His guidance. And then He gives us three categories. One is a subcategory. The munafiqoon is a subcategory of the kafirun. This is very important to understand. The munafiqoon are a subset of the kafirun. But the believers and the disbelievers are the two main categories, as you will see from the beginning. ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنْزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُوقِنُونَ أُولَئِكَ عَلَى هُدًى مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ This is the first group. And Allah starts off with the believers and their description and their qualities, what they believe and what they do as a result of their faith. So you find from the beginning, this is the book, the Quran, where of there is no doubt. There is not a single doubt about any single word in the Quran. And it is the only book 
that Allah has kept as his verbatim, real verbatim words. And he made the plan before the revelation came down. This book is kept in Allah al mahfuz in the holy, sacred, divine kept book. Okay? And then when it came down, Allah sent it down in portions, in small segments, few ayat here, few ayat there. Some of the Quran came down as a response to request from the community. Some came as a response to something the Prophet ﷺ needed answer for. Some came as a result of the believers or the disbelievers challenging or asking questions. So it came. They ask you about this, tell them that. They ask you about that, tell them this. So the Quran came in varieties of ways. The Quran also came with guidance that was not asked for. So it's not all a response to people and the Prophet ﷺ. It came as guidance from Allah. So Allah knows what we need and He would reveal it and send it down to educate us whether or not we ask for it. So when we only read the Quran, when we look for an answer, we are limiting the function of the Quran. The Quran is not a 911 call that you only dial the number if there is something urgent. The Quran is supposed to lead you so that you never need the 911. If you follow the Quran, you don't get into emergency. Things will happen, of course, but that's part of the test. But normally, if you follow the map, you don't need to stop and wait for someone to tell you where to go. If you have a map from the beginning of your journey. So the map is here. The guidance is here. And the book is available. And it's almost available for free for everybody. So why do we desert the Quran? Why do we not read the Quran frequently? Why are we abandoning the Quran from leading our life? Some of the scholars said that the Quran's guidance will lead you into paradise if you put it ahead of you, which means you follow it. If you put it behind your back, it will push you where you don't want to go. If you desert the Quran, there are other forces that will pull you in a different direction. And as you will see from the Quran, you find Allah defining for us the forces that influence us. So a few ayat down the line, Allah will talk to us about the angels and their role in our life. And the devil and his role or their role in our life. And that we have choices. We have the power to choose. We could listen to Allah. We could listen to the devil. And we have the intellect. We have the power of intellect. And the power of reasoning. And the power of logic. And the power of driving at conclusions. And the power of understanding. All of these powers are packed in this couple of pounds of what we call the brain to work our way into the Quran and in this life with the torch in our hand. What is the torch? It is the guidance given to us in the Quran. So if you want to travel your journey towards the hereafter in a safe, constant, straight path, the only way is to keep the torch lit in your hand and to lend it to others when they need it or share it with others as they need it, as they ask for it. And humanity is thirsty and hungry for the Quran. And we Muslims did not only abandon it, we are hiding it. We are concealing the Quran very big issue if you think about it. So this book indeed, this is the book whereof there is no doubt a guidance to those who practice taqwa. 
piety and righteousness. Observing Allah. So if you don't observe Allah and you still read the Quran, maybe one day the Quran will guide you. There used to be a man that the companions of the Prophet وسلم, went to the Prophet and told him, O oh, Rasulullah, you know this person? They gave him the name. He said, yes. They said, he comes and he prays behind you all the time. He said, yes. Then they told him, he's a thief. He steals. The Prophet Sallallahu answer was, shh, hush. لا تمنعوه الصلاة. Never push him away from prayer. فصلاته ستنهاه يوما. His prayer one day will stop him. Never push him away from prayer. Never tell him, how come you pray and you are a thief? How come you pray and you are an adulterer? How come you pray and you drink? How come you pray? The masjid is a hospital. Hospitals do not get customers of healthy people. They get customers of sick people. So the masjid should really be able to accommodate and absorb all of these people and give them the time to cleanse, the time to join with their heart, not only with their body. It takes time. It took us time to come here. It took us time to be regular in our prayer, all of us. So the Quran says, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ أَلْقَى إِلَيْكُمُ السَّلَامَ لَسْتَ مُؤْمِنًا Don't you say to someone who's coming to join you, saying, I am a Muslim like you. Don't you tell him, no, you are not. تَبْتَغُونَ عَرَضَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Do you just want to show off and enjoy the pleasure of this life? You want to just make a name and a fame for yourself? He is Musalli, he is great, he is this, he is this, and then condemn any and everybody who's not joining? No. Allah comments and says, كَذَلِكَ كُنْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ فَتَبَيَّنُوا This is where you were one day. And Allah blessed you. He did you a favor. When he called you and attracted you, and open your heart for the call, it is his gift. It is not your good soul. It is not your good self. It is not your generosity. It is not your favor unto others or Allah. It is Allah's favor upon all of us. So when a sister comes to the masjid and she is not dressed in hijab or full hijab, or this is where she wants to be, this where she should find hospitality, respect, accommodation, and encouragement, and support, and love, and compassion. And the only way we could offer such a person what they need is to remember what Allah says. Remember, one day you were like this. كَذَلِكَ كُنْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ But when we couple our faith with the arrogance of righteousness, we destroy our own faith. When we think of ourselves as we are better, we act like the shaitan. That's what the Quran is saying. The shaitan, when ordered to bow down to Adam, to prostrate to Adam, he said, I am better than he is. We should never take this approach. We get people here in this masjid, who are trying to wean off of alcoholism. Where should they go if not to the house of Allah? Some people feel, no, 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 I don't like that smell. No, 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 he should not be here. And they cite the ayah, وَأَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْتُمْ سُكَارَ But they don't cite the rest of the ayah. The rest of the ayah is, حَتَّى تَعْلَمُوا مَا تَقُولُونَ Until you understand what you're saying. So if the person 
is not overtaken and overwhelmed by his drunkenness. He is able to reason. He is able to talk. He knows what he wants to do. He knows how to pray. Let him in. Let him in. Welcome him. He is your client. Take him for lunch or dinner. Get him out of his environment. Befriend him. Because those people are ours to keep. This is how this masjid got filled. 34 years ago, the masjid was only that small house. In that small house, we used to get 30 people maximum for a Friday prayer. When it was full house. 30, 35 people. You know now how many people we get? It's about 1,000 every session of three Fridays. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all for making it what it is. It is your presence that makes this masjid what it is. The attraction is you. People come to this masjid because they say, we feel good being at Dar al-Hijra. It is our responsibility to keep people coming with all of their shortcomings and pain and suffering and complaints. This is the hospital and the book is the cure. So when someone comes like this, offer them some love. Embrace them, do not embarrass them. Let them feel that this house is for them as it is for all of us. Because if we turn them off, you may never tell. This will be the last time they will ever go to any other place that is called a masjid. So brothers, the believers are known to be merciful to each other. We should exercise this. So faith is not limited to just making prayer or establishing prayer or fasting or spending few dollars here and there. Faith is to trust Allah and to act accordingly. Faith is to follow Allah's guidance and to trust the outcome, to trust His support and to let Him do what He has always done for you. Let Him do it with others as well. And you become the tool in the hands of Allah. What a blessing. Tuba liman ja'ala Allahu hawa'ij nasi inda. Lucky is the one in whose hands Allah delivers what people need. If Allah uses you to help someone, the Prophet says, It's better for you that Allah would guide someone through you than having all the best of camels. Red camels are the best of camels in milk, in wool, in everything. So we have to look beyond the basics. Alhamdulillah, many of us are good with the basics. Praying, praying sunnah, doing adhkar, all of this, very good. But this is your spiritual nurturing to your soul, to, to have some control over yourself. But where is the benefit for people? Do you know what the reward is? The reward for your prayer, your fasting, your zakah, even your hajj, in comparison to helping someone get something done? Let me share a hadith or two to show you the benefit. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, لَأَنْ أَمْشِي مَعَ أَخِي فِي حَاجَةٍ أَقْضِيهَا لَهِ أحب إلي من أن أعتكف في مسجدي هذا شهرا أقوم ليله وأصوم نهارا. Should I repeat it again? It is better for me, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, to go with someone to get something done for him, to help him get something done, whatever this is, as simple as giving him comfort. As simple as giving him a meal because he needs it. As simple as giving him advice. 
as simple as anything you do to help anyone. The Prophet is saying, to do this gives me more reward than staying in my masjid for a whole month of seclusion, i'tikaf, in which I pray the whole night and I fast the 30 days consecutively. Why squander such rewards? People come and ask us for things all the time. Why do we forward excuses when there is none? Why do we try to escape people asking? While if somebody comes to you, even as a guest, he's not asking for anything. The guest comes to you with whatever expectations he has. When he eats and leaves, with him go all of your sins. Not only you, the household. Zunub Ahl al Bayt, all of it is scrapped off. So when we understand the value of what we need to do as faithful believers who trust Allah and the reward we get, I am sure if somebody tells you, I will give you a thousand dollar if you take me to Dallas airport because I am late and I need to go and I have nobody but you. You would go. Who makes $1,000 in one hour? Anybody here? Raise your hand. Nobody. So when the reward is awesome, the energy is there because there's a motive, right? We need to appreciate the reward of what Allah is inviting us to do. So here, it defines the believers as uh, the muttaqeen are those who believe in al ghaib they establish prayer and they spend from what we have provided for them and believe in what has been sent down unto you and what has been sent down before you so do the believers believe in the quran of course do the believers love the quran they should. They should. And they would. Do the believers believe in what is called the Bible and the Torah? The believers believe in the original revelation given to Moses that the Quran refers to as the Torah. But the Torah today is a compilation of books that people wrote hundreds of years after Moses. So when someone says, I believe in the Torah, to someone who doesn't know what you're talking about, you need to be clear. Don't mislead others. We believe in the Torah as it was given to Moses, not what is written after Moses. That has to be made clear. We believe in the Injil as it was given to Isa, not as it is written today after changes, modifications, reviews, and all of that. We don't have the original Torah. We don't have the original Injil. That is a fact that we know, and they know. So there is no need to mislead people. So we believe in Allah. We believe in what he has sent down unto Muhammad sallam, and what he has sent down unto Moses and Isa. وَمَا أُوتِيَ مُوسَى وَعِيسَى and we believe in the hereafter. The belief in the hereafter is the strongest motive for the believer. If you constantly remember that you're going back to Allah and you're going to stand accountability, your faith is enhanced and actively guides your choices. But when you believe in the hereafter and put it in a box, and lock the box and throw it behind you, it doesn't become faith. It just becomes an idea. The difference between the faith and the idea is the believer gets his ideas from his faith. But anyone else, they have their own ideas despite their faith or lack thereof. 
I will repeat this. The believer gets his ideas from his faith. Anyone else gets their ideas from anywhere despite their faith and their resources. So a Muslim, for example, who says that he or she is a secular Muslim, which means he believes in the separation of the word of Allah from real life issues, social issues, political issues, uh, economic issues, educational issues, welfare issues, uh, people's interest. If you want to do this separation, you're not Muslim, you're just secular. So claiming to be a believer and a secular means that the person's faith is put in a lock and a box behind him. And he is going to lead his life according to his own ideas. So when the ideas are separate from somebody's faith, then faith becomes dormant or dead. You know, when you don't travel a route, a route for a long time, some people live with us here for five, seven years. Then they go overseas, they have a job, and they work for 20 years. And when they come back, they, they start relearning where things were and uh, who's still here and direction and stores and because things change, right? When we leave the book for a long time, when we desert the Quran for a long time, we become estranged from our own source, estranged from the word of Allah, estranged from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those Muslims who have never read the Quran or did not read it for a long time or did not practice Islam for their childhood, their youthhood and beyond, those are lost so-called Muslim by idea, but they never turned it into a faith. Why? Because there are other ideas competing with their faith and they go with those ideas. But the believers who are successful are the ones who live their faith and they get their ideas from the Quran and the Sunnah. So whatever idea that comes to your head or is presented to you by someone, whatever invitation, whatever group, whatever club you want to join, you want to check with the Quran. Is this consistent with my faith? If that step of checking with the Quran is lost on us if we don't do it then we will go along with anything and the Quran will become strange to us it will become difficult the Quran is saying the believers they establish prayer what do we do in prayer other than reading Quran and making dhikr what else do we do we make dua right we ask Allah for what we want we submit our complaints and Allah listens to us and responds to us. We purify our soul through our prayer and we encourage ourselves to get the right motives so that after prayer, we are better than before prayer. So if prayer keeps improving you, that means your connection is really well with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something very comforting. So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ula'ika ala hudan min rabbihim. Those who follow the guidance and stick to the word of Allah and practice it. And they are connected with Allah, connected with his book, connected with their prayer. They are guided. They are living on the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The guidance of Allah carries them through and helps them through difficult situations, sickness, disease, difficulties, trouble, anything. And those are the winners, the successful ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all successful in our faith. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى 
وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد Today we are giving a farewell to a very dear sister who grew up in this community as a young adult when she came she joined the masjid as a volunteer until her last day she's been volunteering she used to come and ask me what else can I do she worked as a social worker with Fairfax County and she has been offering whatever help she could to our social service department to people in need mentally sick young children and youth she never spared a minute of her life without doing something positive may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her soul sister Hawa Warsama from Somalia is a real example of, of love, compassion and care for everyone whether you were Muslim or non-Muslim she cared for you she was a very 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 much as much Muslim as anyone would want to be may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her soul and accept her into his merciful hands Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa qina wa sarf anna sharra ma qadayt اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول بي بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون بي علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا كربا إلا نفسته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته ولا جبارا إلا قصمته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته اللهم ارحم أمواتنا وأموات المسلمين أجمعين واختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة